It's October 27th, 2011. We're in St. Louis, Missouri for game six of the World Series between the Cardinals and Rangers. Texas is up three games to two and trying to close things out for their first ever championship. The game's tied at nine with David Fries leading off the bottom of the 11th inning and the count full. You might recall what happens next, but to truly grasp the power of this moment, you have to understand what's enabled the cards to reach this point. The 11th inning, the World Series in general, or even October baseball at all. So let's rewind. St. Louis is somehow still alive, but just an hour ago, the idea they'd have a pulse right now would have been absurd. A level of absurdity perhaps only surpassed two months ago with the idea of simply qualifying for the playoffs. The early part of 2011 was not so kind to the Cardinals. After picking up the club option for the final season of Albert Pujols' contract, their superstar first baseman gave GM John Moselak a deadline of spring training to work out an extension. This was a player coming off a decade-long run in St. Louis that solidified his place as arguably the greatest right-handed bat in baseball history. He won NL MVP three times, finished second another four times, and helped lead them to a world championship five years ago. So even calling him a superstar might still sell him short. But the two sides couldn't work something out, and it created a dark cloud over their season as it seemed likely to be his swan song in St. Louis. Then, over the next few months, the injury bug attacked him pretty hard. Just a few days into spring training, it was discovered that Adam Wainwright, their all-star pitcher who was coming off back-to-back -back top three Cy Young finishes, while posting the second best ERA in the majors, would need Tommy John surgery, knocking him out for the entire season. The day after he homered in their season opener, all-star left fielder Matt Holliday underwent an appendectomy. Pujols broke his wrist a couple months later in a freak accident, though he returned just 17 days later despite an initial projection that he'd be sidelined four to six weeks. Even manager Tony La Russa had to step away for six games to treat a case of shingles. Though they still made it all the way to this point, the 11th inning of the World Series' sixth game, with Freeze at the plate trying to help in the Cardinals' pursuit to deliver another championship to St. Louis. Which might mean just a little extra for Freeze, a local product who grew up in a suburb of the city and was a huge Cardinals fan as a kid. He even wore number 45 in Little League to pay homage to legendary pitcher Bob Gibson and attended high school about 26 miles away from Bush Stadium. Freeze would be drafted by the San Diego Padres in 2006 before getting traded to his hometown team for longtime center fielder Jim Edmonds in December 2007, then eventually became their everyday third baseman in 2010 until he hurt his ankle in June before an August setback ended his season. Then this season, while dealing with issues to huge, established names like Holiday, Wainwright, Pujols, La Russa, an injury to the lesser-known Freeze also had a tremendous impact. After an outstanding first month of the season batting 365, the third baseman broke his left hand when he was hit by a pitch in Atlanta on May 1st. That cost him nearly two months, and the Cardinals had a losing record during his absence. But they still wound up tied with the Brewers atop the NL Central at the All-Star break, thanks to last offseason's signing of longtime division rival Lance Berkman, who was the league's best hitter during the first half of the season. In early August, about a month after returning from the hand injury, Freeze got drilled with another pitch, this time in the head, again costing him time. But he'd return from all that to wind up here, and the pitcher he's facing right now is Mark Lowe, a Houston native who's got his own local ties to his team, having gone to college just a couple miles from the Rangers' ballpark. He's also had his own up and down year in his first full season as a Ranger after a trade that sent him and Cliff Lee to Texas last year. He struggled over the first few months of this season, even getting optioned to the minors for a bit in April. Lowe got it together a little bit down the stretch, though a hamstring injury kept him off the Rangers roster for the first couple rounds of the playoffs. He obviously made the World Series roster, but has only pitched one inning so far, which was during Game 3 five days ago, in which he faced Freeze and allowed a hit. Lowe being in such a high leverage situation right now might be surprising, but the Rangers being here is not. They are the defending AL champs, having made last year's World Series before falling to the Giants in five. Although they lost some key pieces from that pennant-winning squad like Cliff Lee and Vlad Guerrero, they signed standout third baseman Adrian Beltre, shifting Mike Young to DH, and also fleeced the Blue Jays in a trade for Mike Napoli. 
While those two acquisitions have arguably been Texas's two best bats this season, Young was not pleased with his shifted role and demanded a trade. But nothing materialized, so his disgruntled ass remained while playing excellently for the ninth year in a row. Combined with second baseman Ian Kinsler, right fielder Nelson Cruz, and reigning MVP Josh Hamilton, the Rangers have a lethal offense. They were atop the AL West every day for the final four and a half months of the season and route to a franchise record 96 wins. But that wasn't enough to get home field advantage in this series. No amount of wins would have been. Because in Bud Selig's world, something as trivial as who gets an inherent advantage in the World Series shouldn't be determined by something like, you know, merit, but rather which league won the All-Star game. And this year, that was the National League, thanks in no small part to this back-breaking three-run homer that losing pitcher C.J. Wilson, the ace of those Rangers, surrendered to a Prince Fielder. So that's why we're here in St. Louis instead of Arlington. But truth be told, two months ago, no one thought there was a chance in hell the Cardinals would have crashed the postseason party at all, let alone advancing all the way to this point, the 11th inning of Game 6 of the Fall Classic. In addition to all the Cardinals' injuries, their bullpen was a mess early in the year. Closer Ryan Franklin blew four saves by mid-April before being demoted out of that role and eventually cut. They cycled through a few other guys that couldn't get it done before things steadied once they settled on Fernando Salas, then made a July trade that brought in starting pitcher Edwin Jackson and relievers Mark Zepchinski and Octavio Dotel. However, it didn't look like any of it would matter. That's because they woke up on August 28th with a 69-64 and record, trailing the Brewers by 10 and a half games in the NL Central and the Braves by 10 games for the wildcard spot. But they got extremely hot, made another change at closer, installing Jason Mott after more than two months without allowing an earned run, and wound up winning 17 of their next 22 games, including five out of six against the Brewers. Nevertheless, it wasn't enough to take the division from Milwaukee, so for St. Louis, it was wildcard or bust. Fortunately, the Braves totally forgot how to baseball down the stretch. In that same period, they lost 14 of 23 games, providing the cards a glimmer of hope. But Atlanta was working from such a cushion, they still had a three-game lead with just five games left on each team's schedule. The cards won three of their next four, the Braves lost four of their next four, and they pulled dead even with one game left. The Cardinals sent ace and former Cy Young winning pitcher Chris Carpenter to the mound for that one, and he tossed a complete game two-hit shutout while fanning 11 in Houston, possibly the greatest game in the 36-year-old's illustrious career. Then they played the waiting game to see what would happen in Atlanta, where the game reached extra innings before Braves pitcher Scott Linebrink, the very same dude who broke Freeze's hand with an errant fastball five months earlier, allowed this little baby infield single to Hunter Pence miraculously sending the Cardinals to the playoffs as the NL wildcard. Entering September, the only way St. Louis could have made the playoffs was to be the league's very best team that month, combined with Atlanta being the league's very worst. And that's exactly what happened. Their reward was an NLDS date with the Phillies and a rotation featuring three of the NL's top six pitchers. But the Cardinals ultimately forced a winner-take-all game back in Philly. It was a showdown between Roy Halladay and Chris Carpenter, best friends from years spent together in Toronto, guys that have vacation plans together in a couple weeks to go fishing in the Amazon rainforest. They put on an amazing pitching duel, and Skip Schumacher's RBI double in the first inning was all the cards could muster against Halladay. But that was enough, with Carpenter tossing his second complete game shutout in 10 days and propelling St. Louis to the NLCS with a 1-0 win. There they faced the Brewers, and led by series MVP David Freeze, St. Louis took care of Milwaukee in six games to win the pennant and end up here, tied in extras of the World Series. But while the Cardinals' journey was filled with obstacles that they overcame, Texas had a much smoother ride to this point. They knocked off Tampa in the ALDS in four to advance and face the Tigers in the ALCS. They rode the historically red-hot bat of Nelson Cruz to a six-game win, setting up a World Series clash with the Cards. The team split the first two games in St. Louis. In Game 1, Alan Craig drove in what turned out to be the winning run when Cruz couldn't make this play in right before Texas evened it up when the normally untouchable Mott couldn't close out the game the next day. The series shifted to Texas for Game 3, 
but the Cardinals absolutely exploded for 16 runs, led by Pujols, who had five hits, three of which could not be contained by the field dimensions of Rangers Ballpark in Arlington. How about three on the night? And they took a 2-1 series lead behind his World Series record 14 total bases. But the Cardinals apparently only packed enough offense for one game and combined for just two runs across games four and five, dropping both to head back to Missouri, down 3-2 and on the brink of elimination. After MLB decided to push game six back a day due to the mere threat of rain, when it was finally time to play, La Russa gave the ball to Jaime Garcia while Colby Lewis got the nod for Ron Washington's Rangers. And with Free standing here now after 10 and a half thrilling back and forth innings with a chance to do something heroic, it was actually a crucial mistake of his that helped set this table. With the score tied at three, Josh Hamilton popped up the first pitch of the fifth inning, a routine play that big leaguers make in their sleep. But Mr. Freeze did not. And as a result of his error allowing Hamilton to reach base, the Rangers took the lead when he got a ride home from Young. St. Louis pulled even when Yadier Molina drew a bases loaded walk in the sixth, but then things started slipping away from the Cardinals. Instead of scoring again to seize the lead, as one might expect with the bases juiced and less than two out, Napoli instead caught Holiday sleeping at third and picked him off, letting Texas off the hook and knocking Holiday out of the game in the process when he hurt his pinky against Beltre's cleat trying to get back. Then Beltre and Cruz led off the next inning by taking rookie Lance Lynn deep as part of a three-run inning that left St. Louis trailing 7-4 late. Yet here we are with the score all tied up in extra innings. How'd we get here? Well, in the bottom of the eighth, Alan Craig, on his first swing of the game, got back one of those runs, which he only had the chance to do because he took over for Holiday after his mishap at third base. Jason Mott kept the Rangers scoreless in the top half of the ninth, keeping the deficit at two. The cards were now down to their last chance at the dish against the Rangers' outstanding young flame-throwing closer, Neftali Felice, who's allowed just one run in more than 10 innings this postseason. It didn't get off to a good start when second baseman Ryan Terrio struck out, but then came Pujols, who clobbered the first pitch he saw to left center for a double, bringing Berkman, representing the tying run, to the plate. He drew a four-pitch walk, and then Craig went down on strikes for the second out. Up came Freeze, one out away from elimination, and pretty soon, just one strike away from elimination. With the Cardinals season hanging by the very thinnest possible thread back in the ninth, the Rangers' primary goal was simply to not allow an extra base hit. And the Rangers in their no doubles defense is similar to football's prevent defense. But on the next pitch, Freeze was able to launch this fastball to right, where Cruz wasn't stationed deep enough, then misread the ball as it soared over his head for a game-tying triple when the cards were down to their absolute last gasp. So that's how we hit extras, where La Russa sent Mott out to pitch a second inning, and even after Elvis Andrews singled off of him, Mott remained to face Josh Hamilton. And though Mott has mostly been a rock in the back end of the Cardinals' pen, it's a curious choice. That's because La Russa had at his disposal this guy, Arthur Rhodes, a man who turned 42 years young a few days ago, and who was actually a Ranger earlier this season, guaranteeing him a ring one way or another. He's a left-handed specialist who's only been called upon twice this series, each time to retire just one batter, and each time that batter was Josh Hamilton. But not this time, and that was a 406-foot mistake. At the wall, Hamilton has gone deep. So again, the Cardinals had to overcome a two-run deficit to keep their season alive. But they let off the bottom of the 10th with back-to-back -back singles, and a bunt moved the tying run to scoring position. Terrio drove in one with this ground ball, but that was also the inning's second out. And after Pujols got a free pass, that brought up Berkman, their final hope. Rangers pitcher Scott Feldman got a second strike off this foul ball, again bringing the Cardinals a single strike away from heartbreak. But again, they refused to die when Berkman slapped this single to center, keeping a season alive that should have died so many different times. And after the Rangers couldn't do much against Cards pitcher Jake Westbrook, that brings us here, to the bottom of the 11th with the hometown kid Freeze leading off with Mark Lowe on the mound, trying to cap an up and down evening to force a game seven the next day for all the marbles, 
about 46 minutes after already rescuing them from certain defeat. Lose this game and it would be a crushing end to the two month fairy tale that got him to this point, while possibly marking the end of an era with their first baseman who's been such a monumental figure and face of the franchise for 11 years. But win and we will see you tomorrow night. Welcome to a moment in history. Breeze hits it in the air to center. We will see you tomorrow night. The Cardinals went on to win game seven the next day to become world champs, then saw Pujols sign a $240 million contract with the Angels. Anyway, thanks so much for watching and don't forget to like, subscribe, and click to watch more of our stuff.